Welcome to the Grow Fast Podcast, where we talk with leading sales, marketing, and personal growth experts about how companies can accelerate sales, optimize marketing, and grow their businesses fast. Let's go. Hey, Matt. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, Mark. How about yourself? Pretty good. Now that we solved that technical difficulty there, that <laughs> well, I was like, sales guys, it, Matt, it was all me, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, um, whereabouts are you located? I'm here in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Chicago. Well, I hope you don't think this is weird, but I was kind of going through your LinkedIn profile and I, I think you went to Seattle University. I did. I did. Yeah. God, it seems like ages ago. Wow. Yeah. So I'm, I'm out in the, uh, the Bellevue area and uh, my, my oldest son went to the University of Washington and my youngest son is going to Seattle SPU, Seattle Pacific University. So, um, oh, wow. Yeah. Small, all, all from that. Yeah. Sm- small world. My wife actually grew up in Bellevue. She went to a uh, Eastside Catholic. High school. Oh yeah, yeah. Which is probably yeah. right around the corner from you, right? It, it it pretty much is. Yep, yep. Yeah. Well, hey, um, I'm I'm really looking forward to talking to you about some of the best practices when it comes to training sales teams. I I think that you know when you're when you're in a sales role or you're leading a sales team, that's kind of um, always be learning and continuous education is is super super critical, especially today with um, you know the changing landscape in terms of prospecting and all the tools and everything like that. So I'm I'm looking forward to talking to you about that. But first, maybe we can do a level set and you can tell us a little bit about um, Sales Assembly, you know, what it is that you guys do and how do you do it? Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, and thank you again for, for having me. Uh, Sales Assembly, so we've been around for about seven years now, a little bit over seven years. What it is that, that we do is we provide all the day-to-day skills training for the go-to-market teams, both sales and post-sales, uh, B2B technology companies. So kind of where we see ourselves sitting in the space is there's product training, which is self-explanatory. There's process training, right? On, you know, training on medic or med pick or training on the methodology like Challenger, Sandler. Then there's skills training, right? And that last component, that's all that we do. We noticed that there was this gap in the B2B tech ecosystem where a lot of sales leaders or sales enablement leaders, they spend a whole lot of time on product and process training not nearly as much time as they should on skills-based training, teaching AEs how to get better at negotiation or teaching account managers how to get better at multi-threading. So that's kind of where sales assembly slots in and fills this training gap within B2B technology companies. Well, that's awesome because you just answered a couple of my other questions. And so I don't have to ask those, but I, cause I was wondering about, uh, you know, what do you do for B2C versus B2B? But if you just focus on B2B and it sounds like B2B specifically technology, um, what are, let me ask you, you I mean, you picked a kind of a, a pretty narrow slice of the t- overall business landscape. What are the characteristics of B2B technology sales that, um, are different when it comes to, cause you're providing skill-based training, um, uh, you know, why the focus on that area and why is that different from just regular old B2B sales? Yeah, we, so when, when we first launched this, we, you know, we did so under the thesis that. If you are an account executive, a CSM, a BDR, SDR, whatever the case may be, at a company like LinkedIn or Outreach or Gong or Sprout Social, whatever the case may be, you're selling different products to different people. But the fundamentals of how you do it when you check under the hood, it's all pretty much the same from company to company. Um, so we thought that there was this degree of consistency. Again, if you are an account executive at any one of these companies, um, becoming better at deal management, right? At discovery or team selling or multi-threading. That kind of stuff is important anyway, right? Regardless of the product that you sell or who you sell it to. So that's what we focused our training on. To your other question, how does that differ from under, from other industries? We do understand that if you're looking at like a Venn diagram, right, of the training that we provide and training that sellers in a B2C environment might need or a services environment might need, there is going to be a good amount of overlap, but not nearly as much as there is in just B2B technology companies. So we did decide intentionally and have continued to decide year over year to remain singularly focused on this niche of B2B technology companies for that reason. It makes a lot of sense. And one of the, I guess, 
uh, rules that, or, or, you know, I guess guidelines that I like to offer teams that I'm leading is targeting is really, really important. Knowing which industries, which companies in those industries and which people in those companies do you want to target? How do you want to target and why? Because if you try to go out and do everything for everybody, that's a recipe for a failure right away. Um, so, so what are, if we talk about the skill sets in this, um, you know, area that you've decided to focus on, what are some of the, the, the most important skills that you help go in and kind of, um, I guess, teach or reinforce? Yeah, for it, when you take a look at the landscape today, you know, August of 2024, the most in demand across the go-to-market spectrum on the new business development side, right? As you can imagine, it's all just around pipeline generation, mm -hmm. right? So cold emailing, cold calling best practices, what works, what is effective in this day and age compared to even two to three quarters ago. Um, if you're an account executive in a closer role, again, with there being more and more stakeholders involved in every single purchasing decision, when essentially regardless of the traditional buyer that you're selling into, everyone is essentially selling to a CFO. Right now, mm -hmm. that concept that we spoke about before, deal management, right? How do you mm -hmm. effectively sell your product or solution when you're not actually in the room to mm -hmm. convey to the actual buyer, again, see above the CFO, here's what the product or solution that we're offering is going to bring to your organization. And then on the post-sale side, where we've been doing a lot of work over the past two years, it is really just this high-level theme of how do we get CSMs or account managers, depending on how you define them within your organization, to become more commercially minded, right? How do we get them better at identifying and, and taking advantage of expansion opportunities and going from much more of a reactive team to more of a proactive revenue generation focused type of organization? Yeah, I mean, those are all super important. And I, I, I'm curious be, uh, about some of the specific skills because a lot of what you're talking about are also, um, I guess, kind of interweaved with any company's process as well. Yeah. Um, and so let's, let's kind of go through those three different areas there. If we talk about, you know, basic outreach or cold calling, cold emailing, um, any type of cold prospecting, what are some of, I mean, just give me some examples of some of the key skills um, that people need to be working on. Because I tell you what, I know it's a lot different than when I started in sales and it's a lot, even a lot different than, I mean, some of the tactics, I guess, are, are, are very different now than even a couple of years ago. But, you know, what, what are some of the key skills that you're, you're, you're training on? Yeah. And I think uh, uh, where some of you just said that the tactics, right, that is something that yeah. sales assembly in our training sessions that we're going to be heavily focused on. You know, we want to focus less on theory and philosophy and more on like, mm -hmm. okay, here's something that you could take away from this course and start putting into action straight away. So if we're hosting uh, a series of courses on the concept of cold communication, right? Cold calling, cold mm -hmm. emailing, or even social outreach. What our courses are gonna dive into are going to be, again, some of the tactical things as far as like, okay, how do you structure subject lines in the first opening line of the preview text of an email, right? What are the most effective call to actions in this day and age, you know, and what are, Oh, go ahead, please. Oh, no, no, I'm just because I want to know, man. <laughs> it's funny. I just had a, a, a discussion last week with, uh, with our CRO in terms of, I, I think it was like a half hour discussion about uh, subject line uh, for, for some, some emails that we were doing and, you know, different generations, different perspectives, different uh, continents. And, and we would just, and I was like, how, why is this so hard? Well, the reason it's so hard is because we're all bombarded, inundated with all of these spam kind of prospecting emails. Most of them, in my opinion, are not very well done. And so I started kind of doing reverse engineering and saying, which emails am I opening and why am I opening those? Um, but I, I'd like to hear from you some, some, just give me some, some, some tidbits about that. Like, you know, how, how would you kind of coach that or have that conversation? Yeah. So, you know, digging a couple layers deeper, you know, the conversations that, that we're having a lot of now is like, okay, how do all these weave together, cold email and cold calling and social selling, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the ultimate purpose to your point a moment ago is what is going to get you Mark, to actually open the in the first right. place. And so we need to think of it less of in the, uh, from a standpoint of like, okay, what is the best subject line that's going to get you to open this email and more of like, okay, do I recognize the person that's sending me 
the email and do I see him or her as a helpful advisor? That's what, as mm. an executive, you know, we're banking that that's what's going to make you more or less inclined to open the email that I send you. So how does that play out from a training and development perspective? Can go back to what I mentioned a moment ago. How do we leverage these different levers, right, of cold communication, calling, emailing, social selling to build us to a point where it's not about getting you to open, to open and respond to my very first email, Right. It's about making sure that when I do send you that email that does have that compelling call to action, asking you for a meeting, you're going to be like, OK, well, yeah, this guy, Matt Green at Sales Assembly, um, I've seen him on LinkedIn. He's been providing value there. He called me, left me a voicemail. You know, a week ago, I didn't call back because I don't respond to cold calls like a lot of executives don't. Um, but, you know, I, I opened a, an email that he sent me two weeks ago. He didn't ask for anything. He just provided value. The resource he provided was helpful to me. I'm going to open this email because, hey, maybe it's equally as valuable. So part of what, and sorry to go on the long with the grant, but part no, of no, what. No, no, is, this is awesome. Yeah, part of what we're working yeah, to, to impart on a lot of these BDRs and SDRs right now is thinking about it less of like, okay, well, I got to get good open rates on this one email that I send. It's like, oh, how, how do we put together a true sequence, a true campaign? Right, that builds components of value over the course of a period of time so that when you do go in and get them and ask for the meeting, you've actually earned the right to do so. And you feel as though the executive on the other end, on the receiving end of that email, is saying like, yeah, this is someone who just based on my limited experience with him or her over the past few weeks, as I've been seeing them on social, they've been popping up in my inbox, they've been you know, blowing up my cell phone, whatever the case may be. There's someone that has been providing value along the way so i am going to give them the time of day that's just the hurdle that a lot of reps need to get over right now is how do we convince someone like you to give us the time of day in general mm -hmm. um no it makes a lot of sense and I, I also believe that you know providing value in every interaction you have with a customer prospect is hugely important um and some of that comes down to i hear that a lot these days is, is people need to focus on or spend time on developing their personal brand because when you know when you reach out as matt or i reach out as mark if they've heard me on a podcast they've seen my email something like that uh maybe they've we've met hopefully ideally we've met right uh, ideally but um how do you balance you know building your personal brand versus building the you know promoting the company and and because sometimes you can get what's the word maybe distracted and doing too much of one and you know, it dilutes your effort on something else yeah, no, that, that's a very fair point. And, and to be clear, it's less about building. You see a lot of people building a personal brand, I think, just for the sake of building selfishly a personal mm -hmm. brand. And, and when I say selfishly, I mean in the sense that it is in no way, shape or form meant to benefit the company that they're working with, which to be clear is fine if they want to do that. Right. But that is different than um, if you are a BDR and SDR leveraging the concept of social selling by building a personal brand, again, to your point a moment ago, just in the way of providing value, right? So um, rather a tactical example, rather than what a lot of reps do is they take the content that is provided by their marketing or their communications team, and they just click repost on a platform like LinkedIn. That is different than if I'm trying to sell into you, Mark, I'm looking through your LinkedIn activity. I'm seeing when you're posting about something that has to do with your business, your industry. And rather than just hitting repost on my company's content all the time, I'm dropping into your comments like, hey, Mark, you know, by the way, this post, here's something that, that we just came up with that we think would be valuable that ties in to the topic of the post that you just made. So it is, it is sort of interacting with you as a human. It just happens to be doing so on the social platform. That's what we talk about when we're talking about building an effective brand for the purposes of furthering the business of the company that you happen to be working for at that time. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Let's, let's go back to the email for a second, um, cold emails. Um, can you give me some of his examples of how you provide value in those exchanges? Is it just providing information or what do you do? Yeah, so a clear cut example, real world example for this, uh, my friend Todd always highlights the, this example. Um, uh, an SDR from a company, I, I forget the, uh, the industry, the company what was trying to sell to, to him a few, um, not that long ago. And he, um, 
he did research on the company, knew when to schedule the board meetings and about a month or maybe three weeks before their next board meeting was meant to uh, to be scheduled. The SDR just popped into his inbox. Hey, by the way, here's a template that, uh, that other people have found effective for their board meetings. Thought you might find this valuable, right? That was it. Like, no ask, like, no, like, hey, let's hop on a call. Let's chat more about this. We'll love to tell you more about what we do. It's like, hey, Todd, I know that you're going into a board meeting in a couple of weeks. Just in case you need a template, here you go. Right. Wow. And then That's, a few weeks. Yeah. And then yeah. a few weeks I later. Lo- I love that example. Yeah. Yeah. But then a few weeks later, he did that again. Right. Like, hey, I saw your mm-hmm. hiring. Right. Like, hey, by the way, here, here's a market report on salaries and OTEs for AEs right now in Q3 2024. Just thought you might find this valuable. Right. And then you do that three or four nothing, times. Nothing about, nothing about, hey, can we get a meeting or, hey, can I, can I sell you on this? Or, hey, here's a link to a, how great our platform is, something like that. Just, hey, just, just being of service. Yeah. 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 It, it, exactly okay. that. And then you do that three or four times. And then again, going back to what I mentioned a few moments ago, by that time, when I'm popping into your inbox for the fourth or fifth time, when I am truly asking for a meeting, number one, you're going to be much more inclined to open my email in general because I've been providing value along the way. And number two, mm-hmm. when you see me ask for a meeting, you're probably going to be much more inclined to actually accept it. I would agree. It would work for me or work if, you know, if somebody was uh, prospecting to me and they were um, sending me all this useful information because it's amazing how, you know, we all get spam, 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 and 99% of it is spam. It's not yeah. anything that's um, helpful. Um, when you talk about, you know, the, uh, the, if we go from SDR, which is kind of more cold outreach, and then you want to go up to like account executive, what, what are some of the key skills that you focus on? Yeah, some of the key skills that, that we focus a lot on these days are going to be um, multi-threading. Uh, multi-threading is, uh, is big. Um, multi-threading and empowering your champions to sell without you in the room, right? So the two different things are making sure that, number one, to the extent that it's possible, you're getting in touch with all the right stakeholders, but at the same time, preparing those stakeholders to sell without you needing to be there. So if we, if we want to say we, we want to make sure that we're um, at least first off informed who all the stakeholders are um, and then that we're in touch with them, I think that a lot of um, account executives, especially if they're relatively junior, uh, they're afraid to ask those kind of questions. Uh, w- what are some ways that you can kind of uncover who else is involved in the, in the buying decision um, in a kind of tactful, non, I guess, threatening way? Yeah, um, it, they all boil what, where we've seen success and where a lot of people that we work with have seen success is really, as you alluded to before, boiling down to just find the tactical way to just ask the question, right? And there, yeah. there are a couple different iterations of this. You know, one that we see people, or I'm sorry, that, that um, has apparently worked really well for people is asked like, hey, you know, who else should be involved in this conversation? Who else would feel left out of this conversation? Um, like that. if, yeah, if we were scheduling a second call, who, who would feel left out if they found out that they weren't invited to that call? Um, you know, us at sales assembly, given how we sell to revenue leaders day in and day out, you know, we can get a little bit more to the point. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. who's going to hold budget for this? Right. Um, at the same time, there is an argument to be made for regardless of who you sell into asking that direct of a question, where's the budget going to come from for something like this? And it's like, okay, does, you know, if Mark is the holder of that budget, do we need to make sure that he's involved in the next conversation? So again, it comes down to just at the end of the day, rather than trying to dance around it, finding some clear cut way to just ask and hopefully get the clarity that you need directly from the prospect. Excellent. I, I want to come back to the next part of the question, which is, you know, how you, once you find out who those stakeholders are, how do you prep them or prepare your champion to help them educate them or, you know, kind of sell to them. Um, but before I, we, we touch on that, I want to back up a step and, you know, I sit in on a lot of B2B SaaS calls um, because we're getting sold all kinds of different sales enablement tools. And I mean, just everything, you know, everything's B2B SaaS these days. And um, it seems that a lot of times the initial call, and I've even, I I don't know how many times I've booked a demo 
booked a free trial. And then the first call is not a demo and it's not a free trial. It's a somebody who's a qualifier. And we spend 30 minutes doing this dance where they're asking all the questions that they want to know, but not really helping me. And it gets frustrating. And, and, and I don't know if you have seen something similar out there, um, but if you, you know, how do you coach that? Okay, we know that you have your internal qualification kind of metrics that you have to go through, but how do you balance that with actually, you know, providing some value with that to the, the, pr the prospective customer? Yeah, no, that's, um, that's a great question. I mean, fortunately, we've seen, and this has happened pretty rapidly over the past year. A lot of companies that used to do that, and I've been on the receiving end of either those calls or more frustratingly, those emails. Like, great, before we hop on yeah. the call next week, answer these 10 questions. Like, no, you're trying to sell me. What, why am I doing right. work right. for you? We have seen this pretty mad dash away from the seller-centric type of approach to much more of a buyer-centric type of approach. Um, we see a lot of organizations, and we do encourage this, um, we encourage them to look at the data and come to the realization that by the time you're talking to any prospect, they've already done a considerable amount of research. So while on the one hand, like, sure, you want to make sure that there is some level of qualification going on that's not wasting um, your time, the rep's time, uh, going back to what you mentioned before, you want to find some way of instilling value in that conversation. And that is what has um, helped transform some of the XDRs teams that, uh, that we work with, where they're not, again, just going through the checklist, but the organizations are empowering them with enough product knowledge, but more importantly, enough business knowledge, enough business mm -hmm. acumen to actually have, you know, a quote unquote adult conversation with a prospect yeah. in a way that does not feel like they're just going through an interrogation and saying like, okay, now Mark, you're worthy of talking to someone that's, else that's, on my team. You just described exactly how I feel. Dude. Yeah. Going through an interrogation to determine whether or not I'm worthy. It is funny because um, I literally last time, it was Wednesday or Thursday, had a call with a, a platform. They they allow, they provide like a, a market intel kind of uh, prospecting platform. And um, on their website, it said, sign up here for a free uh, trial. And then the first call was with a you know junior SDR uh, type role who then told us, actually, we can't give you the trial until you talk with me, and then I will pass the information on to an account executive who will have a follow up call with you. And at that point, I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. But I went, I went through the call because you know, one, I'm already here. I, I, maybe I can learn something. Two. Um, I can learn something about their platform, but two, two, I can also learn something about somebody's sales style, their, their process, their techniques, and who knows, you know, I and, um, but it, at the end it came down to, yeah, it was just, it was just a qualification call and it was kind of frustrating. So, uh, let if me, let me go else, back. I was going to say, sorry to interrupt. You could also learn oh, one other thing. You could also learn yeah. what you don't want your team to do going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I should have recorded that and said, do not do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me ask you, go back to the, the, the earlier question in terms of, okay, you know, you're an account executive and you figured out who the stakeholders are, who the other, you know, who, who else is going to be involved in this decision. How do you prepare your champion or the person that you have the contact with uh, to go out and kind of internally, I, you could use the word sell or promote this idea or, you know, kind of just educate everybody else involved in the, uh, in the process? Yeah, that's where... Um where we not only as an organization sales assembly, but we do have a lot of sessions that revolve around this, um, teaching the concept of, okay, how do you put together a compelling business case, right? A, mm -hmm. a true business case, not a pitch deck, right? But a true business case that does speak to the value that you, um, and when we talk about value, uh, both ROI, return on investment and COI, cost of inaction, right? Balancing both of those sides. How do you prepare something that speaks to that? that can be easily digested by the other stakeholders, primarily the, the CFO or controller or whoever is going to actually end up writing the checks. Um, and the, you know, the one thread that, that we, that we like to constantly reinforce when we're putting together or when we're coaching people to put together these types of business cases. And again, we've seen this in our own experience is that executives and CFOs, especially they like summaries. They don't like stories. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So shorter, the sweeter, right? It, it's, um, it is natural for verbose salespeople like ourselves to, you know, load up slides and like, Hey, you know, don't forget about this feature and that feature. It's like, no, just focus on based on what you've discovered throughout the sales process, throughout working with your champion, what is going to be the most impactful for the organization? Maybe develop the business case in conjunction with your champion, partner with them on it, have them take a look at the draft of the business case that you are preparing and give them the opportunity to say, well, no, 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 let, let's change this word and let's change this term and you know, let's focus on this, have them coach you on how this will land a little bit better within the organization and do as much work for them as possible so that all they have to do is click forward on an email and say, hey, see below, see attached. Here's something that I think we should seriously explore and here's why. So would that be something like, um, you know, here's a current problem, here's a proposed solution, which will result in X amount of savings or X increased amount of product productivity or X number of wins, et cetera. Um, and it will, and then I would assume you probably want to put the cost in there at some point, some, something like that, but maybe, yeah. Uh, and make it just kind of, I want to say bullet pointed, but make it very easy to understand and clear, right? So how do you teach, now I want to come back to your, your platform. How do you teach that in a virtual environment? Because I mean, now you're sounding like, uh, I, 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 could, I could teach that in a classroom environment where I'd say, okay, here's all the information. I want you to distill it down into an executive summary. Everybody go. And then we're going to, we're going to see what everybody's done and you're going to pass it around and you're going to grade each other or, or kind of critique each other. And then we're going to share some, some, some great examples up here on the, on the board. And then I'm going to give you my worst case ex example that I'm going to prepare and you're going to, you know, help me kind of improve it, something like that. But you're not doing an interactive environment, are you? So, so how do you teach that? Yes, yeah, so it's a great question. To an extent, we're providing an interactive environment. So for, for context, the, the way that we structure our, our training curriculum is, number one, yes, to your point, everything's virtual, but number two, it's all live, right? So oh, we are, okay, okay. Yeah, so we are, rather than having a whole lot of pre-recorded on-demand content, which can be valuable, mm -hmm. we think that there's a whole lot more value in providing a live collaborative training for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, uh, research shows it tends to lead to much better learning outcomes for the people that are participating. And number two, it creates this really interesting pull effect where when the individual contributors from the companies that we work with start going to our training sessions, they want to continue going to more because if we're doing a session on negotiation, for example, for account executives, within that session, there may be 100 AEs from the few hundred different companies that we work with, not only learning from the facilitator, but also learning from each other, right? So bringing this back to, to your point, when you take a look at number one, that the cadence of training programs that we're offering, five to seven programs per week, week in and week out all throughout the year, it does allow us to invest more time over the course of rather than just a single session, but a series mm -hmm. of multiple sessions on the skill of like deal management as we as we talked about before and within that curriculum on deal management we will have dedicated 60 minute courses on how to write a compelling business case or a mutual action plan right you know how to multi-thread a little bit more effectively yeah. how to drive urgency throughout the sales cycle in, in an organic and meaningful way as opposed to manufacturing fake urgency by saying like hey if you buy by the end of this month we'll, we'll give you a discount I, you know, that's a, that's another one. I mean, you, you probably can come up with a better way to, um, <laughs> to summarize my thoughts around that. Like, uh, you, but it's just, you're trying to manipulate me, man. Would you just stop it? You know, <laughs> cause these days almost, it, it's funny. It seems like these days that at, at the end of every, you know, demo or trial, they always want to come back and say, Hey, if you sign by the end of this week, uh, or if you, you know, I'll, I'll talk with my boss, but I'm pretty sure if you, if you sign by the end of the month, I can get you this, this and this. And, it's like, you know, I, I think we're starting the relationship off on the wrong, on the, on the wrong way. I prefer that we just have transparent, open discussion and don't want to feel like um, I'm being kind of really shoved into a deal. I mean, you know, and wh what do you advise companies in, in that scenario? Yeah, well, you, you used the word a moment ago, transparent. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Todd Capone. Um, or his book of the transparency sale, but he has a really great framework, which we do bring him in to teach uh, to the sales assembly ecosystem throughout the year. 
But it is, again, as, as you can imagine, so this whole concept around transparency and communication, especially when it comes to negotiation. So his framework um, would essentially maintain that you as the seller, you should always keep in mind that there are different levers, right? So for example, if we're getting to the point late in the sales process where, um, where it is time to talk about the commercial structure and you're saying like, hey, you know, well, you know, can I get a discount on this, that, or the other thing? You know, the response is, okay, you know, the price is the price, but, you know, if we are going to provide some type of flexibility on the pricing, here's what we're going to need in exchange. You know, here's what's important to our business, right? One thing right. that could be important to our business is length of the contract, right? Sure. So, I mean, you know, if you're willing to go for two years as opposed to one, yeah, we, you know, we could pay you in the form of a discount of 10% off of the, uh, off of the contract price if you're willing to commit to longer. Another thing that we're interested in is having more seats as opposed to less. So sure, if you buy more volume, we're going to be able to pay you in the form of a discount of another 10% off the deal. And just going through that down that checklist like that, and again, laying yeah. it out clear as day so that you and the buyer could come do the, uh, the agreement that makes sense for the both of you is going to be much more effective than trying to manufacture fake urgency by saying like, I don't, you know, I don't know if I get this approved, but maybe if you sign by <laughs> August 30th, yeah. you know, we, we could get you 20% off. Yeah, that's, that's, I totally agree with you on that. And that, that's awesome that you're, you're, um, kind of training in that, in that direction. Um, if we go back to the, the, the mode of, or the style of training, uh, you know, you mentioned there could be like a hundred different, uh, participants in a online training program. It, it's live, but it is online. Um, how do you provide opportunities for interaction or do you, is it via chat or do you do a, a, what do you call a breakout rooms or how, how does that work? Yeah. So we, we do make sure that as a point for all the training programs, that there is always going to be some level of interaction. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we have tested, uh, so we do all these, all the programs via Zoom. We have tested doing small breakout rooms over the past few years. What we found tends to be a little bit more effective and a little bit more seamless is having just interaction throughout the session with a large group. Right. So that will come in the form of the facilitator engaging with, uh, attendees in a one on one fashion while the whole group is listening. They'll mm -hmm. also come in the form of attendees engaging with other attendees, right? And, and this is where the collective mind share comes to bring a whole lot of benefit because going back to your example a few moments ago, if we're talking about templates for a business case, right? You know, we may have someone, a rep in the room, share what worked for him or her. Then you may have someone else come up in and say like, hey, you know, yeah, we've done something that looks sort of like that, but we made this one change. And it works so much better for X, Y, Z reasons, right? So in addition to the structured facilitation, you have this really great level of osmosis that comes along just by having all these really great individual contributors in the room who, again, are all doing the exact same job, just the different B2B tech companies. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I start almost every training program that I've conducted, I start off by saying, hey, if you expect me or just any other trainer to come in here and tell you how to do your jobs, it's not going to work. What we have to do is we have to harness our collective experiences and know-how, and we have, to, we, have, we have to create a framework that we can share and collaboratively really learn from each other's, you know, uh, success stories, you know, uh, challenges that we faced, maybe, you know, things that we've done wrong, but we can learn from that and, and ideate upon all of that. Um, and so it's, 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 it's hugely important, I think, to get that kind of network effect. It sounds like you're doing that very effectively. Um, let me ask you this though. I mean, some companies might be reluctant to have their um, sales people, uh, what's the word, participating in a uh, a training program with the competition because you mentioned there could be multiple companies. So how do you deal with that scenario? Yeah, that uh, we we get asked that question a lot, as you can imagine. Um, what we found in doing this over the course of seven years is that the companies that and I won't mind using names, but companies like Outreach and Sales Off, right? Companies that, you know, direct competitors. And there was a time where they were, you know, going at each other publicly. Mm -hmm. um, we worked with, with both of those organizations. What we found is that when you got the ICs, but just as uh, importantly, the leaders in the same room with each other, but, you know, the guard comes down. 
right? Then they mm-hmm. all like, hey, we're, we're all trying to do the same thing, right? Um, you know, yeah. we're all here to, to better ourselves. So sure, you might have some companies that, that might say like, hey, you know, we want to make sure that our reps are not talking about like internal, you know, roadmaps, you know, product initiatives that, that we're working on to give any insight into the competition. But if they're all there just to learn about how to become better negotiators, right, or how to become better at qualification, we see the guard coming down pretty quickly and they're more than happy to engage with each other. Okay. That, 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 that makes sense. Um, let's, let's take it to, to, I guess, take it even further back. And in terms of how, take me through like how sales assembly does its outbound sales and what the different meetings look like. And, you know, and I mean, you're running a sales team. So, um, do your sales people take these courses as well? And, you know, yeah, eat, eat, eat our own dog food, so to speak. Yeah. So our <laughs> gourmet um, cooking, gourmet cooking, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so our our outreach, if you want to call it that, is so what where we've never found success personally as an organization is with traditional cold outreach. Um, mm-hmm. Where we tend to do really well is leveraging social specifically linkedin just because again we sell to revenue leaders and b2b tech a lot of our buyers are on that platform and as we spoke about earlier it is a really organic way for us to provide value build name recognition before going in and asking for a meeting because let's be honest very 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 few people or organizations are actively searching right now for like hey you know i I could really use some skill development for mm-hmm. my team with, with the limited budget that I have. So we leverage social, I like to think in a relatively effective way to just build the awareness again, not only of us, but you know, when we make posts or drop into people's comments about like, hey, have you tried this? They, our buyers look at it and say like, oh, that's interesting. What is the sales assembly thing that I keep seeing on there? Um, so we have some systems built internally that gives us pretty good clarity to um, how often we've interacted with our buyers on LinkedIn, our potential buyers on LinkedIn, um, before we go in and actually ask for a meeting, right? Because we do want to make sure that we have laid the groundwork to an extent. We mm-hmm. leverage in-person, um, in-person meetings to a pretty significant degree. We bounce around to different cities every month across the U.S. So we put together dinners for the VP and C level revenue leaders of B2B tech companies in the area, vast majority of which are going to be prospective members of sales assembly. And to be clear, the purpose of those dinners is not to talk about sales assembly. It's about building relationships, right? Meeting people face to face, building some sort of authentic human relationship that we could then see if afterwards there's an opportunity you know, if, if I, if Mark, if, um, if you, if I fly to, let's say, um, New York City or Seattle, you know, if I fly to Bellevue and I put together a dinner for 20, 25 VP and C level revenue leaders and you're in that room and you and I, we have a great conversation, great meal over the course of two to three hours. When I email you a couple of days later and say, like, hey, Mark, you know, would you be open to catching up, you know, hear a little bit more about sales assembly, going back to what we spoke about earlier you're going to be much more inclined to say, yeah, sure. Why not? Absolutely. Um, So leveraging those two things together, heavy on social, heavy on providing value, and really heavily leaning on in-person interactions. That's worked really well for us as far as getting meetings with the buyers that we're looking to get in front of. Yeah, it it makes sense. And one of the, I guess, the things I like about your platform or the way you deliver it is, if I was if I was a traditional content provider and it was just one way content, so you can go and take this online digital course. People, some people are self motivated and they'll go through it. Some people just realize they've got to check the box and get through the course because there's no real interaction there. So that interaction is important, um, but it's also important, I would think, for you, the content developer, because. I, my, one of my questions was going to be, how do you come up with, you know, new content ideas? But if you're actually delivering the courses um, live 
you know, your, your content almost develops itself because you, you know, two years ago, you might not have heard about some of these sales enablement tools. Uh, they weren't even developed yet. And now everybody's asking about them. Which tools should we use? And they're like, well, maybe we should, you know, do a module on the prop, the appropriate use of tools, tool selection and tool usage. I don't know, but you're, you're, you know, you, you're constantly there. Uh, does that, does that, is that part of your process? It, it, it is. Yeah. So uh, two things on that. Number one, the vast majority of the facilitators of the programs that we're hosting throughout the year are going to be other operators from across the, the ecosystem. Right. So, for example, later on this month, in a few weeks, um, we have a session on, again, driving urgency throughout enterprise level uh, deals that's led by the head of enterprise sales at Sprout Social. Right. So she not only is going to be able to bring a perspective of like, hey, I'm I'm going to share with you what's worked for us, but not only has worked historically is still working today. Right. Because I'm still in the role. Right. Right. So I'm still working on this stuff with my team. To your point, nature of sales has changed, you know, God, I mean, over the past two years, just think about how much has changed over the past three quarters right, as far as what works and what doesn't work in, in B2B sales. So having operators come in to provide that real world, like, hey, here's what's working today, helps us keep our content relevant. But also the, the second thing that, uh, that we do is every month we have um, standing what we call peer group calls. And what a peer group call is, is it's just a, a Zoom call. We have 12 different Zoom calls a month, one for the VPs of sales and CROs, of all the companies that we work with, one for the enablement leaders, one for the AEs, one for the BDRs, so on and so forth. And these calls that we do every month, they're not training. It's just a forum for all these people that have the exact same job title and responsibilities to get together in a room, raise their hand and say, hey, here's what I'm working on. Here's what I'm struggling with. How would you handle this? How would you handle that? And it's given the opportunity to exchange ideas and best practices. As you can imagine, just overhearing the signals month after month from what hundreds of people are struggling with at the companies that we work with. That also gives us some really great insight into like, hey, we need to probably find a way to solve for this because we hear a lot of AEs, BDRs, and CSMs continuing to struggle with it month in and yeah. month out. That, that's awesome. Uh, you know, you, you, because your focus is in B2B technology, that, that's your focus market. Uh, I, I'm assuming that you have some markets that are very active versus other markets that are maybe not so active. I mean, if I, I'm on the West Coast, so, you know, the, 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 the Pacific Northwest, there's, there's a big uh, B2B kind of technology startup environment, and a lot of SMBs as well. Um, and then if you go down to Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, uh, what, what areas are you, because when you, when you fly out and you do these dinners, what, what areas are you uh, primarily spending your time in, mostly spending your time in? Yeah, the, the cities will be some of the ones that, that you could probably guess, you know, here in Chicago, of course, uh, New York, San Francisco, Austin, Denver, um, and, uh, and Boston. Um, mm-hmm. so that's where we'll do a lot of stuff in person, but as far as the teams that we train virtually, um, all across North America and to an extent, Western Europe, right? We have a lot of teams that, that engage with our trainings that are based in London and, uh, and the Western part of, uh, of Europe. You know, it's interesting just over the past couple of years, you know, huge disparity between where the company may be based, but where the actual individuals are mm-hmm. within the companies because everyone is so spread out we've made sure to make our trainings from a timing perspective conducive for both north and north american and western european audiences it makes a lot of sense okay let me ask you just a couple more questions here um in terms of your own personal development and growth um you know where do where do you go and uh, what do you do are you a reader a podcast or or seminars what do you do yeah i'm i'm Big reader, I like to think, and by reading, I, I mean audiobooks. Mm-hmm. Um, I always have Audible, got the monthly subscription, so I get a new book every month. Um, big in the podcast as well. And I do have sort of a cheat code because all I'm doing day in and day out is talking with other revenue leaders in B2B tech by function of my job, right? And hosting right. that monthly peer group that we have for the VPs of sales and CROs where 30, 40, 50 of these people are on talking about what's working and what's not working in their respective worlds. So combining all these three things, um, 
provides me, I like to think, um, a good amount of insight into best practices and trends so much so that I actually have started making it a point to not consume sales related books or sales related podcasts because I do need some sense of balance. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's funny too. And I, I, I think there's some, some great sales books out there. Um, but I think at this point in my career, I, I don't want to sound like I know it all, but I, I've, I've covered enough of them. And I, I also look for the variety. I also find that some, some of the books are kind of formulaic where they spend so much time talking about, we found this problem and we did this research and they give you all the background. And if you just cut to like the final three chapters, <laughs> you know, yeah. you could, you could kind of uh, condense it down. Um, but if we talk about that, if you were going to make a book recommendation, it doesn't have to be sales related. It could be just something that helped you. It motivated you. Um, like give me a couple of recommendations. Yeah, two recommendations. Uh, one of them I alluded to earlier was uh, the transparency sale by Todd Capone. Um, okay. The other one, much newer, is called Selling With by Nate Nasrallah. Um, when you talk about just the entire conversation that we had about 10 minutes ago, selling to champions or selling to, to buyers when you're not in the room, that book mm -hmm. should be considered as sort of a Bible. For how Isn't to do that, it? in wow. my opinion. Oh yeah, it's it's well written, extremely tactical, all about templates. You know, things that you can put into practice straight away. That's that's awesome. Um, and what about how do you stay? Because I'm, I'm I'm really getting into the subject of energy these days. Like you know, because we all have. Everybody says time is your greatest asset. Um, I would argue that your your energy is actually pretty important as well because it's what you yeah. can get done in those limited number of hours that we have every day. Um, so, what do you do? What energizes you? Ooh, um, interesting question. So, what energizes me is. You know, it, it sounds a little bit hokey, but I'll I'll run through the, the list anyway. Um, outside of what I do, you know, through work, I, I do tremendously enjoy the conversations, especially one on one conversations that I have with revenue leaders throughout the day. Um, to your point a few moments ago about balance, big thing that energizes me is spending more time with my son, um, yeah. allowing myself to to recharge and and refresh at least to an extent, you know, depending on what, uh, what we're doing. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm the furthest thing from, you know, those people that talk about like biohacking and, and stuff like that. But I, I do believe it's important, especially for people that are getting to, to our ripe old ages, right? <laughs> it's like, Hey, you know, basic things like eating healthy and, and working out. A lot. Um, those are also two things that I'm big believers in. I like to think that I do relatively well and have for for the past 20 years. That has allowed me to an extent when building this business, while also raising a son and you know having a family and all that good stuff. All the other life priorities maintain some level of energy that I need to not only get through the day but get through the day in an effective and efficient manner. No, yeah, I totally agree with you there. And, and I, I say that, you know, sales can be incredibly enjoyable, but it's also, it can be, it can be difficult, you know, and you get more no's than you do yeses. And you have, you know, there's a lot of things that we can't control. They're out of our control, the macroeconomic environment, the competition, whether or not we ship on time, don't ship on time. And if you let that stuff wear on you, it can really take you down. But if you can keep yourself focused on, on the positive things in your life and stay energized um, and then celebrate those wins and then they come in. Hey, it can be a lot of fun. So, yeah. Well, hey, um, Matt, I, you know, I've really enjoyed this conversation and um, I, I, uh, I'm actually looking forward to seeing some kind of uh, samples of your content. Uh, I'm very curious right now. I'm sure you've got some kind of program that you can send my way. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for coming on the, the Grow Fast podcast. Yeah, no, thank you for having me, Mark. I really enjoyed that, this conversation. I appreciate you uh, you sharing the space with me. Likewise, cheers. Cheers.